Aaron Mankey, Rabia Chaudhry, Rebecca Lavoe, th these people who speak out against Mike, they are absolutely not the reason Wondery separated from Sword and Scale. The relationship between Wondery and Sword and Scale is not a boss-employee relationship. This whole idea that Mike got fired and that Sword and Scale has been canceled and that he isn't making money anymore, that he is going to have a problem paying his employees, it's not true. Go look at your subscriptions. He's been posting episodes. They are free to do whatever they want. It is not Wondery separating from them that has destroyed the podcast. Mm -hmm. It is Mike's destructive attitude and his self-destruction that has brought the podcast down, not only in quality, but in everything else. All right, settle down, everyone. James Allen McCune did an oopsie. Uh-oh. Welcome to... F say fact? Feck. Feck? Feck. The fuck does feck mean, it's James? Like you put fact check together, that, that was a good name for the show, is feck. feck. You want to watch feck tonight? That's it's the... Feck. Okay, that sounds... Feck. I, yeah, you gotta do it like... I have to go fat. I have to sound like the TMZ guy. That's what this is. Yeah. I don't even look. You had me wear this jacket. I'm wearing a t-shirt and shorts. You look like a fucking dumpster. I want to make sure that you look. Well, you don't. You don't. Again. We're going. Oh, we're doing it again. Oh. Just go. Just go for it. Hey, down, everybody. Uh oh. James Allen McCune did an oopsie, or did he? Today we're going to discuss. Uh, what the fuck happened with his episode of Gray Area? You can't say fuck on TV, dude. What the fuck? Going again? You sure? I mean, you could just bleep it. It's. You get. You said going again. <sighs> Gray Area. His show was posted, and there's some, some conflicting opinions about it. So we're gonna talk to him and get, have him clarify those. I don't want to say Today, fact, dude. Huh? Like not again, dude. We already got. You just cut it in. You need to go. Action. If you're going to talk about true crime, you have to have a little bit of empathy for the position of the people you're talking about. If you like true crime, you're really going to love this. Sword and Scale. It's run by a guy named Mike Boudet. He's an interesting figure, <laughs> to say the least. People frustrated with the way that he treated his fans. A fan, she tweeted, If anything ever happens to me, please make sure he covers that in Sword and Scale. He replies, And she died of mild heart disease and a high cholesterol diet. You probably shouldn't dump on your fans. There is a Tumblr page named an open letter to mikeboudet.tumblr.com. It's a very lengthy chronicle of all of the things since his podcast began that he has done to be a dick to the public. He posted this thing on or around International Women's Day. A holiday I've never actually seen anybody throw a party for or celebrate in any real way other than virtue signaling on Twitter. That's it. That's the joke? Oh, oh that's terrible. Oh. Why would you say that? What the fuck? Robbie Ochagri. Her and... Aaron Mankey collected as much of his history of, of being a dick and put it in front of Wondery, who is his podcast's parent company. The post on International Women's Day was the straw that broke the camel. Literally got fired over a joke. So he got fired from his own job? I sat down with him for two hours. What, what, else, what else are you gonna do to me? What else are you gonna do? You're gonna get, you got me fired, you got me kicked off my network, lost a bunch of money, probably almost cost all of my employees their jobs. What else are you going to do to me? You're going to burn my house down? As this has gone on, I've been feeling very conflicted about how I feel about Mike. He is suffering, even if it is his own fault. He's he's going through a lot of shit right now, and I really, I'm worried about him. Is hurting people emotionally enough to take away him and his employees' jobs? Because he's not physically hurting people, but like this shit, this could actually, there's a few people that it sounds like he's like releasing their personal information online and like directing folks to go after them. He eventually doxed me and then he told his fans I should die. What? Uh, and what if this guy goes off the deep end one day and just decides to shoot the people he's upset with? Crazier things have happened in this world. Is it rolling? Yeah. All right, cool. Appreciate you doing that. Cool, it's Mike. Is this a good time? Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, What's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay, so <clears throat> let's address some of the uh, wonderful notes that you guys had for me on the first episode of Gray Area. One of the things in particular that I actually really agreed with was the fact that I was speaking kind of about a woman's issue, and I was sort of speaking for women without actually speaking to a lot of women who might have experience with these issues. I, I mostly just talked to my guy friends, so great point. To rectify this, I decided to sit down with a few of my lady friends that I really love and admire and ask them about what it's like for them on the internet, because another thing that a lot of people had to say was, what's the big deal with Mike asking for nudes or like chatting up women and flirting online? What's the big deal? So before I even get into this, I wanna address the fact that a lot of people are gonna call me uh, a white knight or that I'm being a cuck or a big liberal about addressing social politics in the first place. But the truth is folks, whether you like it or not, the internet's a different place for ladies than it is for guys. And I don't really know what that experience is. I don't know how to avoid that issue when we're talking about these things. So. I decided to sit down with uh, my lady friends and ask them what the hell that's like. You, you and I actually had a conversation one night when I was preparing for the first episode that you asked me not to include. I think I included 30 seconds of what was probably a three hour talk. Mm -hmm. um, why, why did you tell me not to include that stuff? I out of fear of being attacked. Like what's your experience online usually? Online? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like. That's a whole different ball game. Really? Like, yeah, online is just, every guy online is like a predator. What's, what's the internet like for you when you go on? The internet is a horrible place. I wanted to have this conversation with a guy before I swear. Like, I always talk about this with my girlfriends and everything. Like, we all have that experience with guys online. They're sending pictures unsolicited or they just, and you like hate every day, like even though you're ignoring them, like they I guess that's just think. not my, that's not the way I flirt. So and then is every guy I talk to about this says, oh, I don't do that. But somebody's lying because every <laughs> female I talk to has had these experiences. There's always been like the sexual harassment stuff, people sending dick pics and you know, things that I never asked for my way. It doesn't feel like a very safe place. There are safe communities online, but I think when you're putting yourself out there, out there, like on a podcast, um, there are a lot of attacks that happen. I think I'm less worried about being called a bitch and more concerned about people telling me I don't know what I'm talking about or that I don't have a right to talk about it. Okay, you said that, you said when the lights change. Oh, the lights are changed. All right. Am I supposed to bring this microphone? Okay, so I have to... Uh, all right. So, um, we're going to have James Allen McCune on. This is... I don't... The cord isn't long... Jamie! I love Feck. Say that again. Sorry, I don't know if the mic... I love Feck. This is our first episode, Jamie. I'm hearing it now. It does sound like fuck. All right. How's that? Let's get started. How you doing, boys and girls? Let's have a conversation. I'm not gonna normally do this sort of thing where I sit down and talk in front of the camera like a big fucking YouTuber, but I kind of feel like chatting right now, one-on-one. -on -one. So a lot's happened in the month since the first episode came out. Too much to talk about, really, but this was supposed to be just a really short follow-up video, just sort of addressing a few of the criticisms and correcting some things that I got wrong and whatnot, but Mike has been poking the bear, so I figured let's just dump the whole thing on the boy. Real quick, I want to draw attention to a text message Mike sent me earlier this week where he said, You didn't try to help me, James. You tried to make a hit piece on me and get famous from it. Don't act like your intentions are anything but self-serving. Look, I don't care what videos you make about me. I'm done with this. I won't ever mention you or give you any publicity ever again. Just don't drag innocent people into this that have no need to be a part of it. I promise you, it will backfire horribly if you do. What he was mentioning there was, was requesting that I don't speak about somebody in his life, which I wasn't planning to do in the first place because I don't care about your personal life, Mike, as long as you're not hurting anybody. It's not my business. Also, was that a threat? Did you threaten me, dude? I called him out on that and he said, I'm not threatening you, I'm just saying it'll backfire. You're not gonna look great if you go down that path. Okay, dude. <laughs> Also, I am head over heels in love with that thing about trying to get famous off of him. Let's have a heart to heart real quick. How close and intimate can we get here? Yeah, okay. That's pretty good. Hey, Mike. Being rich doesn't make you important or famous. And even if you were important or famous, it wouldn't make you better than everybody else. And you are not going to make me famous. 
that's not why I did this. And you know it. The important thing about this correspondence that I want to draw attention to is the line, I won't ever mention you or give you any publicity ever again. Prove it. Okay. So we just sat down here. Okay, this go for it. Action. No, this is, this, I was just introing it. Oh, okay. I'm I wasn't sorry. just telling you. No, I, I see. I see. Okay, so we just sat down here. I'm sorry. Let me then. See, this We're is talking exactly, to them. This is exactly what happened last time we started the podcast. So you'd think you know by now. I. But. Was this one of the questions you were going to. I was going to go into it. Are you trying to. We're in it now. We, is that settled? Okay. Okay. So, you should do the intro again, though. That wasn't. So, J, uh, Gray Area, the last video you did, it was a big chunk of a documentary. Quickly explain what it was for people who don't know. For anyone who has not seen it, the link is going to be in the, de in the description to watch it if you're interested in, in catching up. But just as a brief uh, synopsis of what it was, I did an hour long expose, I guess is the word, for uh, um, uh, covering this situation between one of the biggest true crime podcasts uh, hosts named Mike Boudet and the audience that has been gradually turning against him because of his behavior. Um, so it was just basically a deep dive into him and then also into just me processing him. It was mostly my journey into understanding how society treats people and how I should treat him, somebody who I, I don't agree with yes, on most things. Specifically how they're currently treating people who say things that are unagreeable to the public. I would say that it was a very fair video, that's what you said gray area is, is it's a discussion like if, you know, we can completely like ruin this person's life or should we maybe look at it in a different light? And that's fairer than anybody I think personally deserves to give Mike because I just disagree with what he said publicly and it's like, yeah, obviously if you do something in entertainment and you say something the public disagrees with, then most of the time they have the right to be like, oh, we don't want to see you anymore. You are more fair than that. Oh, thank you. But you said you were going to post the full interview with him unedited yep. and then Mike posted it to try and turn it in a way like you were never going to do that. I can't claim that he was trying to manipulate people into making them think that I wasn't going to post it because he didn't explicitly say that in particular. But he did call it a hit job. There is, yeah, there is a heavy implication that I manipulated his words in the, the episode that it was he, he in the description for his video it says it's a hack job or, a some, hack job. or some some sh I some believe that was it yeah that's yeah right. he uh, that I edited him to look worse than he was like that's how mm. it felt to me and other people who read it and were like did you see this yeah which no. is just wrong because yeah did you leave the bit in the video where you said to me Eddie I'm gonna purposely ruin Mike Bidet's life. <laughs> No, I should have left that in though. Yeah, it would have made things a lot clearer. Knowing you, you, like I watched you edit the whole thing. We had a full conversation in the car where you said, I interviewed him. I want to be fair. I can't put the full thing in the video, but I do want to put as much of words that he had in defense in the video. Mm -hmm. You were extremely fair. And I think because of the title and just because he didn't like seeing other people you know say that he was disagreeable. That's why he's posting it in that way. Which, because I was one of those people that Instagram post, this is for me and not for you at all because you're more fair, was fucking stupid. I don't, <laughs> hey, Mike, if you're watching this, it was fucking dumb. Why, why would you say that? Oh, but that's from he, me. He is watching this. Okay. Absolutely. So, he is. Hi, Mike. Hi. Um, can I say something? For, you can totally cut this out, okay. like, if you want to. Mike, um, you framed your thing as like, oh, I got fired for a joke. But there is, um, I'm a comedian. And I actually really love the idea of jokes are kind of a different thing that you can examine. And they're not true words. You can say something that is just funny. But really the structure of your joke wasn't like, oh, ha ha, look at this observation. The joke was clearly, I'm gonna piss people off. And then people went, we're pissed off. And Mike went, whoa, <laughs> what the fuck? Obviously that would happen. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I think that that's, I can see why you would say it like that. And I don't, I don't, think that I immediately disagree. It's really hard for me to like, we were talking about this off camera, but this is a YouTube video. Yeah. Guys, this is a YouTube channel. I am not Netflix. I am not PBS. Right. I am not a journalist. Like hard stop. Yeah. I have no professional obligation to give 
him or anyone else a fair shake. Yeah. I have no professional obligation to make high quality content. It's on YouTube. But the problem is, is that yeah, I have made a big effort to put a lot of care into what, I, what I, I'm doing. Right. And I feel very um, grateful that people have been calling it a documentary because I never called it a doc. Yeah, you they called did. it a video to me the entire time. Yeah, until they did. I think I referred to it a doc a couple times. But After like, the video was posted. Yeah, and it's like, that's just, that's just kind of the format that I decided to go with. Right. But the problem with that is that when people feel like you're making a documentary, like I, my show feels, I am suddenly being compared to every documentary, mm. which is like, it's difficult. It's incorrect. I would say that's fully incorrect because I, yeah. I, I get where there is, as a viewer, when you see somebody make something to that caliber, you want to compare it, but still they got to realize the platform and the situation is like, yeah, you are not a journalist. You never pitched it as like, here's some hard hitting info I found on Mike. You were approaching it as, I am a person on the internet I am someone who can observe this, so I'm gonna condense this information for all of you so you don't have to search for it anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then, even though you didn't have to, you also reached out for Mike and let him defend himself. Which is not a hack job. That's way too fair. I I don't know, man, like, that's just for me, like I was I was raised to be honest and to be a good dude above everything else. And it's, it's really frustrating for people to take away from the way Mike has responded to this, that I am trying to manipulate them into thinking he is this awful person or something without any sort of merit. Yeah. Because that's, the, I, ex I explicitly went into this with trying to be as truthful as possible. And it's, the thing is that it's my YouTube channel. Go to any other YouTube channel, go and watch what they make and tell me if they are inserting themselves too much into their own YouTube channel because that's the response I've gotten a lot, is everyone's like, you, you really made it all about you. It's my YouTube channel. It's not a documentary, it was about you researching all these things. I was making a YouTube video covering my journey into learning about this specific situation and trying to understand personally what this means to me. And I was figuring out this situation while I was in the middle of it. So for folks who don't appreciate that I, I, was, I didn't have all the facts going into the interview, I agree. I didn't. I didn't have enough information to make something as big uh, with with as big of a scale as, as this was, mm. as far as like timing goes. You know, it's an hour long. It's like I, I think if you're going to make a documentary, you should be more informed than I was going into it. And I found very last minute that I was going to interview Mike, and I didn't have all of the information I needed, and focused very much on the social aspect of things, which in retrospect is just not the important thing about mm. the story. It's just not. Nobody fired you because you said the C word on the internet, Mike. They fired you because you are taking your platform that you are extraordinarily lucky to have and you are abusing it. Yeah. And not respecting the responsibility you, whether you like it or not, have to represent the victims of these crimes with respect. And every time that you talk shit online, you are representing them. They are associated with you. Mm. So everyone who's gone through something horrible is now associated with this guy who's going around harassing people online. Yeah, and also I I think uh, in a way, if you are still watching Mike, because maybe he clicked off by now, but there's- um, He didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> but there, there's some things like, I, I never want to, you know, kind of gatekeep of what a comedian is. I'm not a stand-up. I'm a YouTube, you right. know, but I make comedy things. The thing is, um, Mike doesn't do comedy for a living. So when he says, I got fired for a joke, people need to take the joke. Yeah, well, um, if somebody who owns a funeral home just starts to crack jokes about the guy that died, <laughs> and then the family's like, what the fuck are you doing, man? And you're like, well, you're going to fire me for just joking about your uncle that died? Like, oh it's God. not your job to do. That's you're, such a good, that's such a good analogy. Well, yeah, your, like, your personal life can get you fired for your job. Newsflash, asshole, that's always happened. That's not new. That's not the internet, that's not SJWs coming for you. And if you have a true crime podcast where people listen to you and you say things that piss those listeners off and you're like, what the fuck happened? It's just, 
that it's your job to not only tell the true stories of this and do it responsibly, because that's what a true crime podcast would be, but also not to flood your listeners with something other than that. Mm-hmm. If I started doing true crime on my channel, people would be like, what the fuck? This is not what I'm here for. They're not here for your comedy. Like, and no matter, I don't know if it's a scapegoat or if he actually thinks like they subscribe for a true crime, but really they want to hear Mike's jokes. And that's the difference between shows like Last Podcast on the Left or My Favorite Murder and shows like Sword and Scale is right. that he is presenting his show with just the facts. He's He is putting it out there and it's a good show. It's a really good show. It's very well done. Um, aside from the episodes which are plagiarized. They think that McDaniel was a serial killer and they just happened to catch him on his first murder. But a lapse of judgment by the prosecutor and five extra words could have set McDaniel free. The November 15th indictment that launched the court case contended that McDaniel killed Giddings in a manner including decapitation of said victim. By including that phrase, prosecutors alleged that Giddings was alive when her head was severed, a fact that they would have to prove at trial. Had the case gone to trial using the first indictment, McDaniel's lawyers could have won the case without calling a single witness or presenting a single shred of evidence. After watching prosecutors present their evidence, McDaniel's lawyers could have easily asked the judge for a directed verdict of acquittal, yanking the case from the juror's hands. If no evidence of Giddings having been alive during the decapitation was presented, the judge may have set McDaniel free. Luckily, prosecutors caught the error, and on October 20... He has made a very good show that really presents things very straight, and he doesn't really talk with a lot of personality in it, so you're really just coming for the information. That's what I came. I was just coming for the facts. Right. And so for him to include his opinions every once in a while felt very it's, frustrating. It was like, I don't give, I don't care about you. That's also in the, the content, like you're saying, but also on the social media platforms for it. On the social media platforms, he's posting to Sword and Scale. He's not posting to his own personal stuff, and people are going, hold on, look at what he said over here. They're seeing it straight to them. So he's giving his opinions on victims in there, which is unnecessary. He's putting, he put the full interview with you on the Sword and Scale YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's his own personal shit where people are there to listen to true crime, and he's like, you care about this hack job on me. You know, like you can like a personality from something and follow them separately. But where he's trying to say like, I don't know why the fuck I'm getting attacked for my true crime podcast for things I said personally. You said it there on that platform. If you watch any any thread right now, and everything is highly politically charged, obviously, for you know obvious reasons. But every every time you watch the thread, somebody says something on from a left leftist standpoint somebody on the right responds to them in a way that they don't like and then the left person immediately jumps to a personal attack and uh just calling them names and it's like okay well that's the end of the argument there's no argument left at that point to you're be, just calling someone names to be fair i've i've seen you kind of do a similar thing yeah probably because i'm not perfect you're right i'm probably an asshole you're, you're probably spot on, but I'll tell you what, so is everyone else. There's there's a million assholes out there. I'm one of them. And and I think that if you're trying to separate yourself and make yourself better by virtue signaling and going on Twitter and saying, look at this guy, he's such a, he's such a dick, he's such a piece of tr- trash, he's such a... You're no better at that point, are you? You're, you're just calling someone names because you don't like something they said. Now Now you're attacking someone who is a real person and going after them and maybe even going to the extent that Aaron Mankey and Rabia, uh, you know, Chaudhry did and trying to get them fired because you didn't like something they said. One of the main things this guy would say, was he, would, he would just kind of rail against the idea of virtue signalers, people who were kind of uh, faking their beliefs to kind of have favor with the left or something. Okay. And I was talking to some of my friends about what the hell constitutes somebody virtue signaling. And they, they actually had the perspective from the side of the argument that I was making, which was like, if, if people are trying to be socially conscious and like speak up for a problem, you shouldn't speak for them as if all they are is victims. And it kind of made me think twice about like, okay, how do I how do I speak about this in a way that doesn't misrepresent somebody else? Because See, that's the thing. I wouldn't want to be 
spoken for by someone who hasn't had my same experience. Yeah. Like, which is what a lot of people said was yeah. a problem with me being like, this is an issue, we have to do something about this. It was like, it's not, I, I'm not that person. So I like, mean, you can take an ally stance, but unless you personally like experience, I wouldn't want someone like speaking for me who doesn't, because you don't know, you only know hearsay. Right, yeah. You know, so. Yeah, and I was worried that was kind of somewhere I was mis misstepping, was, was sort of uh, acting as if I'm the voice, which is not which was not my intention to be like yeah. you need me. That was never what I was trying to do, but I just it made me think like, well, how how should I speak? About I mean, stuff? yeah, like if you see something that's wrong, you know, even whether you've been through it or not, so it's okay to acknowledge that you see it, you know. You you wouldn't want to be spoken for. But, no, no, but yeah, you know, I would get behind someone who like okay. Say you know someone who's experienced this and you know, you've gotten your information about these issues from their experience, like so like kind of secondhand thing, um, stand behind them, ask what you can do to assist them in making things right, like kind of just make yourself available in that way. Right. Um, would be a good stance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just very sticky getting into stuff where it's like it's not specifically my my fight to fight for, but like, I still want to to stand up for stuff that's important. Yeah, like, so yeah, like I said, I would just get behind somebody who's like having these experiences, who is speaking up and trying to fight for it and just asking well, what you can do. I mean, it's not even like all his fault. Sis like, systemically, it's just like, bred into everything, you know? It's just so funny, because I, I can feel, when I hear you and, and like, literally every other woman that I've talked to talk about this stuff, I can feel the eyes roll from like everyone. First of all, for me coming up here and and being like the one facilitating this stuff and it sounding like I'm trying to like fake being woke or some shit. And then the side of, of like the white dudes who are just kind of like frustrated about being pointed at as the enemy and who are, who are frustrated with being associated with all of the worst parts of. Like, we're not saying that all men are bad. It's just that, like, a lot of men are bad. But, like, what do we do to, I like... think just even educating yourself was doing a lot more than most people have. Like, trying to get other people's perspectives or even, like, talking, like, speaking up about it was important. So, like, the worst that can happen is, oh, Jamie, you're fake woke by doing this video. But also it's the side of, Jamie, if you didn't speak up about this, like, and put the time and effort with the privileges that you have, like you have all these connections and ways to contact people and make these beautiful videos that people actually listen to. All right, another important thing. The vast majority, like 90% of victims are women. That's yeah. why they listen. Thing that I said almost sounded to some people like I was implying all women are victims and that's why they listen to true crime. That's not the case, didn't mean to say that. I think what I was attempting to say was that it's maybe easier for women to empathize with these stories because it's more often the case that these stories have women as victims. And to reference that, I also included a link to a study that I accidentally left a blur on so people couldn't see what the source was, but it was a sexual violence study, uh, which to some people wasn't um, relevant enough to the conversation, I agree. Here is a better study from the UNODC, which is the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. They released a study in 2018 about the gender-related killing of women and girls specifically, and this study is very in-depth, and it also confirms the criticism that a lot of people had on this point for me, and also the point that I really should have made instead of what I did say, which was something like 80 to 90% of all victims are women, which globally is untrue. The opposite is actually true for for, uh, men. So it says here that 80% of all homicides committed globally are attributed to male victims with 20% being female victims. The point I meant to make, I believe, was that women are more likely to be killed by an intimate partner or family member, and that statistic is 82% in favor of women being the victims versus men. That's the key thing that I was meaning to draw attention to. I could have been more clear at the time, but the general idea is that that's the reason why most true crime stories tend to feature women as victims. That's not to discredit all of the men who are victims, but it is more likely you're gonna read about women being killed by their partners, and um, those tend to be the more sensational stories, for lack of a better way to describe it. So that's kind of where I was trying to come from there. I could have been more clear about that. I got in touch with um, Danny, 
uh, who is, I think Mike's assistant, she works for Mike. She is notorious for always being there when somebody is talking about the show mm. or about uh, Mike. She is uh, one of his biggest advocates. We had a very good conversation and she really, she really has a lot of love for Mike and a lot of uh, faith in him. I, I'm just, I would be very curious to talk to her more about this. She says stuff like he feels very big, like he has a very large emotional palette. And I understand that. Mm. Um, I, I, I do also. It's very hard when you feel so much to hold yourself back when something really big upsets you. But every time he does something like this, he's disappointing people like that, people who are rooting for him. Yeah, people who care about him, he's slowly dragging them down into the mud with him. And I can't speak for her. I, I really <clears throat> can't speak for how she feels about all this stuff. Maybe, she, maybe she's supporting the way that he's going to the comment section and stuff. And if that's the case, then I gotta disagree that that's a good thing. But yeah, I don't know. It's like the girl in the mermaid costume, Reyna, she uh, is referenced by Justin as being somebody who was on his side at one point. I've spoken to her since, and uh, she wrote the uh, pinned comment. Yeah, she left a very video. public comment to it's make a sure. Very, that... very lengthy, very well written comment about how he really let her down, and she tried very hard to give him credit. And it's just a matter of time if he continues to act this way. It's just a matter of time before every person on his team does that. And mm -hmm. I don't want that for him. Yeah, I don't want that for anyone. Why? Why? Why would people? want this you know it's like we, we all want people to better themselves and you know that's just there's nobody nobody's like rooting for people to just get worse and for the world to be a worse place mm -hmm. you know it's just like i would i would say and i'm sure this would probably be mike's view is there are some people who i'm sure would love to just see him fail the problem is um that you weren't one of those people and he immediately tried because he didn't like i think the honesty in gray area he was like, well, I need to paint him as one of those people or else the honesty of this would show that I'm kind of shitty or at least have done shitty acts and not apologized for it. It was interesting. He called me the day the video went up. Um, he was in a really bad place that night and he seemed to kind of go back and forth from being mad at me and, and, and kind of seeing some fairness in what I did. And I... I could tell he was in a really bad spot. And I, I said it to him then, and I'm saying it now, like I wasn't trying to take advantage of you or the situation. I wasn't trying to do anything. I was just showing the situation at hand and to, to challenge myself and the way that I view the world by finding somebody who is um, not conventionally easy to work with. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, this, this, this idea that I was trying to make him look like crap, why would I do that? There's so much stuff out there. There's so many people digging through everything he's said and done and doing. It really doesn't make sense for me to make another thing to make him look, but why would I do that? It almost seems uh, like it, it's weird to even have to talk about it because the point of your whole video, you could tell is you were conflicted about it. So I just, I don't even understand the fact that we have to do this but it's because Mike acted illogically. I mean, and not this in general, obviously there are some corrections you want to make, mm -hmm. but specifically to Mike, it's like the whole point of the whole thing was Jamie struggling not to condemn you. And then the video came out and you're like, this dude's condemning me. <laughs> it's like, I don't, you got such a fair chance and you just shit the bed so hard, <laughs> dude. Ugh. It's like instantly, Without, do you realize how good it would be if you just even left like, hey, I think this was really fair. But no, that would mean he wouldn't even have to acknowledge the things that he disagrees with. But it was fair. The video is fair without a doubt. If you didn't like the title, I'm sorry. But like, a lot of people didn't like your Instagram post and it was a lot worse. So I just, <laughs> I, this, this is the main thing too is, is the whole argument from Mike is, uh, I should be able to say what I want and run my show however I want. But his instant reaction to you is, I don't like how you're running your show. Mm. And it's very hypocritical. Because it's just like, you gave him a fair chance to speak on your platform. He didn't do the same to people that he's negatively affected. There's just so much about the way that he's handled every situation he's been in that that is begging for people to keep coming at him. Right. And... It's not their fault they're doing that. 
he claims in the description of the interview that he released on the Sword and Scale YouTube channel that I inaccurately titled it How Mike Bidet Destroyed His Own Podcast. It's objectively true that he destroyed his own podcast. Right. Obviously, you didn't mean that the podcast doesn't exist anymore. And that's the important thing about this. And this is the reason that I wanted to do an episode with corrections and fact checking in the first place, because there is something that I believe I really need to amend that was said um, inaccurately or maybe led people to have a misunderstanding of what exactly happened. So I'm going to, if you don't mind me going Go into it. this right now, I uh, got quite a few emails from people and I did, decided to do some uh, looking into things. And this whole idea that Mike got fired and that Sword and Scale has been canceled and that he isn't making money anymore and that he is going to have a problem paying his employees. Which he said. Yes, believe, which right? these are all these these are all things that he regularly claims on all of these podcasts he's been going on to talk about the situation. It's not true. Go look at your subscriptions. He's been posting episodes. There are more episodes. They have a new host, yes, but on the Patreon, he's still hosting them. And by the way, that Patreon is still in the top 10. He is still making at least $70,000 a month off his Patreon. The show is still going. Wondery's relationship was not as a boss to Sword and Scale. Everyone needs to very, very much understand that they didn't own Sword and Scale. They were fetching ads for Sword and Scale. So when Wondery said, hey, we're not associated with you anymore, they just weren't getting those ads, but they still have the Patreon. They are still making episodes. And there is nothing that he needed to do in response to all of this that merited the response he had. Like he didn't need to say that he was going to cancel everything. When he dropped the reaction to Wondery separating from them onto the show, he claims that he's gonna cancel all of the shows, so, uh, Sword and Scale Rewind and all of those things. He never did that. He never canceled those things. Just like back in the day, he would claim that if he got enough Patreon subscribers, he would take the ads off of the show. He never did that. His defense is that the Patreon version of the show doesn't have ads, and if that's what he said, then that's one thing, but he never said that. Right, so in the whole situation where Mike was saying he lost his job, people lost their jobs, which I can't confirm, I don't know if you can, if anybody in Sword and Scale lost their job for it. I actually saw a report that he hired one person since. Okay, so then if he didn't lose his job, and he didn't lose his livelihood, and he didn't even lose being the host in a way. How the fuck are you the victim, Mike? In what way could you possibly be the victim other than people don't like you for the words you said? Which is why you said those words. The thing he said was to piss people off. And so if the only consequence was he had to host it a little less publicly, but still makes the same money except the ads are gone, I don't understand what he thinks was a hack job about your interview. I didn't misrepresent anything he said. If I, anything, you misrepresented it by not knowing that he's doing better than you thought. Yes, by, by a lot. He is doing a whole lot better than I thought. Right. He's not Kevin Spacey in that he did this objectively wrong thing on the on one side of things, and that's why it's confusing, but he's also not Kevin Spacey in the fact that he lost his career because he's still doing it. Oh, it's hot in here. Uh, when the episode dropped, I became sort of a checkpoint for a lot of people who wanted to share their experiences with Mike. Had a lot of former friends, a lot of friends of friends, a lot of former coworkers reach out to me and tell me different things that have happened, and they were all pretty consistently the same sort of situation across the board. Now, the most interesting thing about that is how many of those people requested that I don't publicly announce that I spoke to them or talk about what they shared with me. People just wanted me to know what they went through which is interesting. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about that. A lot of people were frustrated that I didn't go harder on him or that I had too much empathy for him or uh, that I had a bias, you know, one direction or the other, people were not happy. And the truth is I did go into the situation with a bias. I wasn't a fan of him to begin with. I was looking to change my mind about that, but he didn't. So here we are, same place I started, unfortunately. A lot of people gave me suggestions about stuff to, to read off. Uh, that I feel like, at the end of the day, really aren't super relevant. Things like the fact that he has a DUI, his divorces, he changed his name back in the day, that he's sitting on what seems like hundreds 
of unused websites, some of which sound like revenge porn websites. Most of them aren't active, so it's hard to understand exactly what's going on there. But there's the website he made back in the day that was featured on Fox that was just trying to make him a millionaire for doing nothing. Hey. Mike, who doesn't want his last name used, is a 20-something who lives in Miami. He started MakeMikeAMillionaire.com for fun. But he got the idea from a New York woman who actually needed the cash. And the shenanigan where he took a website domain of a competing podcast and made it redirect to a picture of the host and then to Sword and Scale. That stuff doesn't really seem like it's actively hurting anyone at the moment as far as I can tell, but it is something to mention, I suppose. There are also folks who just really love to label him a narcissist, and really that's kind of above my pay grade to do. I don't like to armchair diagnose people. I don't really think that's conducive to the mental health argument that I feel like is really important to have and one that I feel like he can often detract from. But the thing is, is that if he were a narcissist, then doing two hours of content that deep dive into his psyche this is kind of feeding that big Audrey two of an ego he has. I mean, if you look at his behavior, he's, he's kind of desperate for this sort of thing. This is really candy for him. There was a podcast, the Dave and Isaac podcast, that Justin Drown mentioned in my interview with him that covered a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the correspondences and reactions that Mike had to that are very similar to the ones that he's having here. He creates cycles like this. He loves it. But the point of this stuff is not to bring him down or to make him feel like shit or to destroy him like he seems to think that I'm doing. I think the really important conversation here is the conversation about responsibility and power and the responsibility of power. When you have this much attention and money and... Uh, exposure, you can do a lot of very disturbing things with that. And if you're manipulating people in public, who knows what happens in private. Hypothetically speaking, if there were a person who was desperate for attention and who was desperately trying to dismantle people who criticize him, to leave somebody like that could be really scary. You know, if you're in a relationship with that kind of person, they go onto a public forum and casually mention you indirectly, that could send they're fans to you. And when you request that he say something to those fans to have them calm down with the harassment, all he's got to do is say no, and that stuff just keeps going. That's all hypothetical. But if that were the case, that would be really upsetting. And it would say a lot about the kind of person who would do that. This has been purposefully misconstrued from Mike to the audience so that people would look at him in this situation like there's an injustice. Yeah. And dude, there's not. A lot of people have been asking me where I personally stand now because I was in this sort of state of, I don't know the entire way through the episode. But now that the episode is over, now that I have spoken with Mike and I've had time to think about things and I've seen the way that he has responded down in the comments, which as an aside is really embarrassing for me because I really, I'm, I really, really went out on a limb, not only professionally, but personally. I went very far out on a limb to give him an opportunity to redeem himself in some way. And he took that opportunity to go into my comment section and insult the people who spent their time to, to see the chance that he got and to attack anyone that he felt like he could insult. That is so disrespectful. It is so childish. It is so insulting. And I am viciously embarrassed to have even considered that this could have gone any differently. I don't have any obligation to have journalistic integrity, but I have tried my damnedest to be fair and to represent you in a fair way and to emotionally invest myself into you on a personal level. You drop the ball as hard as possible and I have been really, really disturbed by all of this. This is the most upsetting thing. I don't care if people don't watch, I don't care if people don't think I'm a good journalist or a good YouTuber or a good filmmaker or a good person. I'm frustrated that you took my willingness to give you a chance and you, uh, you just stepped on it. And you're gonna walk away from this acting like I did something wrong to you when I spent a lot of time and effort making sure that I was representing you as fairly as possible. It would have been easier to make a hit, a hit piece on him. Yeah. You said it in the video, you were thinking about maybe making a hit piece on him. And then once you saw it more, you thought, oh, maybe he could change. And yeah, in every single way, he didn't. And that's the thing is that I didn't go into this to try and change him. I wasn't trying to put him in a position to, um, to I don't know, I, I wasn't trying to do anything really. I just kind of wanted to tell this story while it was happening. And I was hoping that maybe he would take that opportunity to 
to reconsider stuff or like look at things a little bit differently and because I did. Yeah. I took everything he said and I really tried to think about it from his perspective and I really tried to get under get underneath what was going on for him and I really stretched my I tried to I tried to really stretch my beliefs in order to figure out where he was coming from and it, I just don't feel like he did that. Yeah, and even if there was some kind of way of him saying, well, maybe that's not true because of the title. If anything, like the title would draw in people that either supported him or didn't, and then gives a fair chance to all of those people to see. You know, it's like you didn't end the podcast by going, well, yeah, Mike's shit, he fucked out his own podcast over, and that's it. You ended it by going, well, we don't know. It's, it's good to discuss it, and it's good to talk about it. And instead of taking the opportunity to discuss it, or to maybe look at yourself a little bit more, Mike. You just got angry and you got insecure. I'm sure you feel feel really guilty for a lot of the things you've done and that's probably why you're lashing out, but you could have taken this as an opportunity to change. The show's called Gray Area, you know? He was saying that you maybe aren't a bad person even though people say you are. And yet you went in and insulted people in the comments and insulted Jamie and tried to paint him as somebody who was just trying to take you down. And that's, full just playing the victim. And if somebody who's trying to help you, you think is trying to take you down, then I don't know what your worldview is on everybody all the time, but you need to seriously reconsider what it is. The thing about how you acted after the show went up, Mike, is that you proved everyone who is against you right. And you gave them what they wanted. Everyone wanted to see you fail, and you did. I didn't want that. I didn't want to see you do the same thing you've been doing, but I did. And I'm very disappointed. And it's not my job to judge anyone. It's not my place to like make calls about if somebody's a good person or a bad person. And I still wanna believe that we shouldn't be judging people by that, by that spectrum. I think we need to look at the individual acts and say those things are good and bad because I want to believe that people can can change and grow. Right. I still believe that. But you're doing more bad than good, and it's not to everybody around you. We are not the ones who are hurting or being hurt. You are hurting yourself on a consistent basis. You are hurting yourself, and it is so disappointing to watch, to just watch you bite yourself every time. It's so, so disturbing. You could be better. You could do great stuff, and you could be a really, really great beacon for growth for the people who look up to you. You just prove everybody who isn't on your team right, that you are incapable of growth. So I hope you're happy. There's nobody around you is. So one extraordinarily important thing about this episode, if, if for no other reason this episode is explicitly for this statement, and it's that Aaron Mankey, Rabia Chaudhry, uh, who I say Ochadri, which is her like Twitter handle, but mm -hmm. she just changed that for St. Patrick's Day, I think. Um, yeah. Mike claims that that is a because she's racist against white people, but I can't, I can't corroborate that. I, it, I just, from what I've seen, people are saying it's because of St. Patrick's Day. So that's the only thing okay. about that. So Mike's been going around claiming that. I, I can't prove. That's why I don't believe that she is. But um, these people, Rebecca Lavoie, th these people who. Um, speak out against Mike, they are absolutely not the reason Wondery separated from Sword and Scale like I claim in the episode. I think on a few occasions I say that they led the charge or they're they're the reason or, you know, I, I think I yeah. really, I explicitly say that a lot and it's just incorrect. The real reason is for what Mike has said and done publicly. I mean, yeah, I mean, there is maybe one or two tweets from Rabia, who, who is especially aggressive about the situation and any political or um, social thing that she gets into. She's a very outspoken person. She uh, she at one point said something like, you know what to do in reference to the audience. As yeah, as that I do disagree with. We talked about before. I, yeah. I, I think it is definitely there's definitely a discussion to be had about um, anything you find like wrong or incorrect, either politically or to, to people but sending um, followers to attack someone, you know what to do is very um, yeah. vague. I'm like, what do we want to do? Are we attacking this guy? Are we destroying his life? Or are we just talking about it? Right, and it just feels like um, 
for me that feels a little irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And um, I, she, after the episode came out, people were kind of pointing out the fact that I was crediting them for being, you know, the uh, torch holders for the situation. But it's it's really the only thing that they did was have the biggest audience of the people who were against them. Right. That's kind of the biggest crime. Aaron especially has only made a handful of tweets about this and then he's been completely silent otherwise. So it is just incorrect and it is, uh, it could very easily um, confuse people mm. for me to say that they led the charge. So I apologize for, for uh, putting that out there because it's just, yeah. I didn't understand the relationship between Wondery and Sword and Scale at the time. But mm. now I understand it a little bit better. And Mike claiming that they are to blame it's just wrong. All right, feeling good, feeling great. So let's wrap this bad boy up. Let's go out with the bang. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it has been wall to wall busy since the first episode dropped, and I cannot include every single thing that has ever happened in relation to the situation. But I can say that when the episode dropped, Mike went on a bit of a tirade in the comment section, as Eddie and I talked about on Feck. He left a uh, big list of comments to Reyna, who was the mermaid girl. I wish that there was a better way to describe her, but she's very good at being a mermaid and seems to be doing well with that. So. Uh, until she tells me to stop, I'll, I'll just call her by that. He had a long conversation with her that ended with him denying that she has endometriosis and claiming she was lying about it, which then led her to sit down with me for two hours in an interview, which you saw some clips of. Uh, you can see the full unedited interview below in my description. It'll be on my Patreon and it'll be on the second channel that I've created for these interviews and for these miscellaneous things that I'll be posting down the road. After the interview I had with Reyna, he then deleted everything he said to her from the comments section and sent her a message apologizing. No idea what to make of that. Following this, he went on a tirade against Rabia where he posted everything she said and did to his Twitter and Instagram, which was followed by him then deleting everything that he posted once again. It's really fascinating when you think about it that a guy who is perfectly innocent of saying and doing anything wrong has a long history of deleting his history off of social media and of having exposés about him released on a regular basis. Go check out the Dave and Isaac podcast. Mike has been kind of radio silent for the last couple weeks, but prior to that, he was making a lot of free speech-based merch on his uh, sword and scale uh, shop, so that's cute. Some of it's kind of hilariously ironic and riddled with a few typos here and there, so that's been fun. It's just so nuts. How does he find the time to keep doing the podcast he was allegedly fired from when he's also got to fit in texting me how he doesn't believe I'm a good person? Now, I can already tell what a lot of you fine folks are thinking right now. Jamie, you're acting a little bit saucier than you were in the main episode of, of Gray Area. What's the deal with that? Well, you're right. I have exhausted my emotional resources on this subject and spent the last month processing everything. I have also been dealing with a lot of difficult, stressful, sad, upsetting personal life stuff and I have dedicated all of my brain power to those things now. So it feels really good to not give a shit about Mike anymore. Uh, not everybody has the pleasure of doing that, specifically Mike. If you are on the position of this guy is an asshole and he deserves whatever happens to him and you're mad that he is so successful and rich, just know that at the end of the day, he's gotta go home with himself and he can't get away from that. So that's really the, the sweetest punishment of all. But Regardless, I would really like to encourage everybody not to lash out. Please do not go after Mike. Do not go after anyone in general. I think it's a really bad thing to do. And I wanna encourage people to talk more, just like I said in the first video. Have discussions. Uh, be more reasonable with the way that you're handling your feelings. Process those things. I was in the mud for a very long time on this. And now that I'm out, it feels good. I let myself feel those things. And um, although life is hard and I've been worried about people trying to lean on that as some sort of uh, comeuppance for me doing this whole series. I've accepted that whatever's happening for me is just something that I have to, to sludge through. And I'm, uh, I'm more focused on that than I am anyone else's opinions. So I encourage everybody to kind of focus on themselves right now. At the end of the day, this is all unimportant. Just figure out who you are, figure out how to love yourself and I'll be right along with you. I really just want to take a moment to thank you for joining me on this roller coaster, and I hope you come back for the next one because it will absolutely be not about this situation. Really want to thank Eddie Burback for hosting the first episode of Feck. He has agreed to come back, so that's really exciting. Thank you to everybody who lent their brains to this whole situation. It uh, is a very, very brave thing to do, and I think it's a very cool thing that people are actually talking down in the comments. I've really enjoyed seeing everybody have discussions instead of just throwing one word at each other to try and make everybody feel bad, for the most part. There's a few here and there, but uh, yeah, this has been very cool. I really appreciate it. Consider supporting us on Patreon. 
um, that would encourage more fun topics like this. Also, for anybody who is in an abusive relationship or anyone who is struggling with mental health, I've put some links down in the description that are some resources. So please go look at those things. If you are in a relationship that you are confused about, if you are feeling like you can't say no to somebody or if somebody is a little hostile about where they are and is blaming you for that situation, there are some resources down below to help you maybe get out of that if you can. Uh, I really hope everybody's taking care of themselves. Have a wonderful day, and uh, I don't have a sign off. I'll figure something out down the road. Take it easy. Be sure to squish that subscribe button. <laughs> squish! <laughs> Comment below <laughs> if you'd like to hear more content. Keep it moist. <laughs>